Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Policy Exchange for this event. My name is Robert Eat, um, and I'm Head of Health and Social Care at Policy Exchange. Isabel Hardman from The Spectator was due to chair this discussion, but unfortunately she's in bed with quite nasty COVID symptoms, so we wish her a very speedy recovery. Um, I'll do my best to stand in. Isabel's actually written a book on this subject, so I don't think I'm going to be able to compete with that, but um, hopefully it means more time to hear from our excellent panel that we've got here today. Um, we're going to be considering how we can improve our hospital environments for patients, staff and visitors. And the reason we're convening this discussion is that last year, Policy Exchange organised the Wolfson Economics Prize, um, which invited entrants from anywhere in the world to submit their proposals to improve hospital planning and design. And it's great to see some of the entrants here in the audience today. Um, many of the responses argued passionately for the introduction of view, views and green space into our hospitals of the future. So we're convening this conversation to discuss how we can make it happen. And we've got a fantastic panel. Um, to my right, Professor Stephen Powers, who is the National Medical Director for NHS England. Um, on the far side, B.D. Webster, who is Nature Recovery Ranger for North Bristol NHS Trust in association and partnership with the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare. We've then got on the line Abe Rogers, who is founder of Abe Rogers Design, and he was the winner of last year's Wolfson Economics Prize, so he can tell you all about his prize-winning idea. And then lastly, Dame Laura Lee, who is Chief Executive of Maggie's. I'm going to invite each of the panellists to make some opening remarks, and we'll then have a panel discussion, followed by a Q&A with our virtual and physical audiences. If you are on Zoom and you want to ask a question, please raise your hand and we'll be able to bring you in to ask your question live. So without further ado, I'll um, hand over to Professor Paris. Thank you, Robert, uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and thank you, of course, to Policy Exchange for the invitation to speak. It's great to be here with uh, at least some of you in person today. We were just saying beforehand, uh, nice to get back to some hybrid meetings uh, at least. Uh, and it's going to be uh, a real opportunity to discuss the work that's already underway in the NHS to enhance healthcare sites for patients, for staff, and of course, uh, for visitors and the public. Now, if Isabel was sitting there, Robert, I'm sure she would have said that her work at Inside Housing magazine uh, has uh, shown that the quality of buildings and the wider built environment uh, is really integral to good health. Uh, so it's not only legitimate, but it's absolutely necessary uh, that the NHS looks hard at its estate uh, and the environment uh, in which we care for people. Not only that, of course, but as a doctor, I know it's essential that healthcare workers speak to people about the environment in which they live, in which they work, uh, and then they make the most of the benefits that come from a healthy home, healthy communities, and of course, uh, healthy workplaces and, and healthy public spaces such as hospitals. Uh, I think, firstly, though, it's important to put this part of uh, this discussion in the context of, of the extremely challenging uh, conditions that we've all been living under and working under for the, for the last two years. And I know that my colleagues in the NHS are continuing to work incredibly hard to deal with current extreme pressures, to tackle the backlogs that we've got coming uh, out of COVID, uh, and also to maintain our long-term ambitions in the long-term plan to improve treatment, to improve care, and to improve outcomes. Uh, we're, we're, what, nearly at the end of February now. We've uh, gone through an Omicron wave uh, over the, the last couple of months. Uh, we're a lot clearer uh, as to what that's meant for us, and uh, it's been a less severe wave, but nevertheless, it's put an awful lot of pressure once again uh, on the NHS. And once again, NHS staff have have really shown just uh, how they can, uh, how they can uh, rise to the challenge of dealing with those pressures. Um, so for instance, uh, during uh, uh, the last few months, uh, we have seen a huge number of staff absences. Of course, this wave has had many more infections than previous waves, that's hit our staff. Uh, we've had almost 5.8 million sick days with more than a third of those due uh, directly to COVID. But despite those uh, workforce challenges, despite uh, the uh, vast numbers of patients that we've treated with COVID, um, our staff have worked tirelessly uh, to uh, keep services going for those with COVID and, of course, uh, for those without. And I know the quality of the environment that they work in is a really important uh, part of that. So the pandemic, uh, as I've said a number of times, has really shown how the NHS can innovate, uh, how it can do things differently. Some, sometimes uh, it seems uh, public bodies such as the NHS, you worry that they can't do things very differently. But I think the pandemic has shown to all of us just the amount of innovation uh, that can be uh, brought to healthcare if it's needed. 
Um, and it's shone a light on the importance of all aspects of the NHS, but I think uh, it has particularly made us think around estate and think about whether our estate is fit for purpose. And so when we're thinking of the long-term resilience of our health system uh, and the ability to reform and innovate, uh, we have to get the estate right uh, too. Um, and a small but important, uh, easily overlooked part of that, for instance, is the huge amount of work that's already ongoing on plans to embed biodiversity and greener spaces across the NHS. And I'm sure uh, Phoebe will say a little bit about that in a minute. Um, and, and to be clear to everybody, this is not just about going green for the sake of it. Uh, it comes from hard-nosed, clinical and evidence-driven understanding that uh, being green, following a green ambition, uh, is better for people's health. It's better value for the NHS, it's better value for the taxpayers who fund us, and of course it's better for society at large. Now we're really proud that in October of 2020, the NHS became the world's first health system to commit to achieving net zero um, uh, emissions. And thanks to pioneering innovations from NHS staff, from our patients, from our suppliers up and down the country, we're on track to achieve our net zero uh, targets. Within our estates and facilities team, our sustainability and workforce colleagues are working to deliver a project to identify opportunities for estates and facilities to enhance green spaces on all uh, applicable healthcare sites. These could be GP surgeries, they could be ambulance stations, rural hospitals, city hospitals, city centre acute hospitals. And green space includes a huge range of things. It includes food growing, it includes space for social prescribing, it includes green roofs, it includes many other opportunities. The NHS Green Social Prescribing Programme aims to deliver uh, and improve mental health outcomes and reduce health inequalities by offering connection to the natural environment through referral to green and or blue social prescribing services. Uh, as I've said, NHS organisations are also supporting biodiversity in a large range of ways locally to help improve the environment for patients, staff and the public. Uh, a few examples, Cumbria, Northumberland, Tyne and Weir, NHS Foundation Trust and well-established tree planting and vegetable growing schemes, which improves biodiversity, facilitates physical activity, whilst at the same time delivering their therapeutic activities. And not far from here, just across the river in Lambeth, uh, patients, doctors, nurses and residents have been working together to build gardens in GP surgeries and NHS hospitals designed to support patients with long-term health conditions to learn how to grow food, and by doing so, improve their own health and well-being. As you might imagine, we're also working closely with our colleagues in the Department of Health and Social Care to explore the available evidence on the benefits of, of designing our hospitals in different ways. So uh, I have said previously, I said at the Health and Social Care Committee uh, a few months ago, that I think we need to look harder at single room provision uh, so that we move uh, further away from open wards uh, and open areas in wards through to more single rooms. And I think that has benefits for a number of reasons. It certainly has benefits around privacy and dignity. We know that from patient surveys. It has benefits around infection prevention and control, and we have been really aware of that during the pandemic. And of course, it helps with some of the flow issues that we have in terms of moving patients through pathways in hospitals as well. Uh, and the colleagues at DHSC are looking at that uh, very carefully, and of course, we are working with them. So there's lots of brilliant work underway. Uh, I know Phoebe's up next to talk about one example of that. Uh, and I really look forward to the discussion and the questions and answers. So Robert, thanks again once, uh, thanks once again for asking me to be here this afternoon. Thank you very much, Professor Powers. Um, Phoebe, over to you. Great. Um, I believe I have some slides as well, just to talk you through. Um, so I'm Phoebe Webster. I'm based at the NHS uh, Trust in North Bristol. Um, and I'm currently funded by the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare through the Government's Green Recovery Challenge Fund. Um, and then this is through the natural... Um, natural? <laughs> this is through DEFRA and um, the Heritage Lottery Fund. Um, so next slide, please. So we have uh, myself in Bristol, uh, another ranger in Liverpool, and um, someone else in West, Northwest London. And so um, it's a really amazing scheme. It's a pilot project, so it only started last year in April, so I've been in place for 10 months. Um, and it's actually just really amazing about what you can achieve in such a short amount of time. Um, so next slide, please. I've just got some examples for you. So these are some of the kind of activities uh, we've been getting up to at the North Bristol Trust. Um, so we've got some bulbs there, we've got some hedge planting going on, um, tree planting, so that's an orchard that's gone in. 
um, at Frenche. So this year, I think we've planted 23 orchard trees um, and then an extra additional 20 trees at the NHS site at Southmead Hospital. And then in addition to that, NHS Forest have donated 500 trees to the Bristol City Council. So that's local parks surrounding the hospitals in Bristol as well that are planted. Um, there as well is an ornamental border, but we've specifically done drought tolerant species, so bringing in climate change into that as well. Um, yeah, and a lot of hedgerows, a lot of bulbs, a lot of other planting going on as well. So I'll give you some more examples. Next slide, please. So um, just looking at the kind of different spaces we have, so this is some courtyard improvements we've been doing. Um, so you can see on the left-hand side is the kind of before picture. So there was um, a big kind of shed structure, all of the plants were dead, big logs in the ground so actually patients couldn't engage with the space and garden themselves. So you can see the picture to the right of kind of the after, so that's the improvements we've been doing. That's my great volunteer, Helen. So um, that's with support of volunteers, the nurses have been gardening, and the grounds team as well. So this space will, we've got an arbor is coming in, so it creates some shade, and we're getting a planter in as well to do some gardening with patients. So bringing in that green social prescribing element as well with the nurses to support them. Um, and then tying in biodiversity through birds, species, um, planters, and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a, a different example again. So these are the rooftop gardens. So on the left-hand side is the new ICU terrace we're building currently. Root work started this week um, to create a space for patients in the ICU to go. So it's got space for bariatric beds. Um, it's designed, one of my interns helped design it. So she's got a background in architecture as well, uh, which is amazing. And so, yeah, works have started. So that will create a space. Um, it's got a pergola there for shade. We've tried to add in uh, some benches and this has been on an on very ongoing project, so this is quite hard to get going. Uh, the space was there, but it wasn't originally designed to be a roof terrace, which is really interesting. We have a lot of spaces like that. Um, so, yeah, getting the ball rolling is kind of the trickiest part, but once it's started, it's really exciting. And then on the right-hand side, that's our herb terrace. So this was originally built into the structure, but we did a big makeover um, and turned it into a herb garden. So the chefs there in that picture use the herbs in their cooking. Uh, the staff sit out there on their lunch breaks. And the views are beautiful, and it's such a great space. Everyone really, really loves going up there. So we've been doing some maintenance over this year as well to get that improved, get some new species in there, and work with the chefs to see what they want and how we can incorporate the food more into that as well. Um, next slide, please. So, uh, yeah, and so just to give you some examples of some of the events and activities that come alongside the work as well. So on the left-hand side, you can see our allotment. So we have a really great staff allotment. Uh, we're currently expanding that. Hopefully works again. We'll start this month. It's very busy. Um, but we have about 37 staff volunteers who come. Anyone can volunteer. And it's also open to the local community. So everyone's welcome to walk through there. We're also starting a green social prescribing uh, gardening group next week uh, with the local link workers and GP surgeries, which is really, really exciting. And I've brought in, uh, we've had cubs and rainbows coming in and building insect hotels with us, running gardening sessions in that space as well. So it's a really uh, accessible space, really open to everybody. Um, and the staff can look out on it as well, which everyone always supports. Um, in the middle there is a different kind of thing we've been running. So that's kind of like one of our wildlife areas in the middle. It's quite small, but you don't need loads of space uh, to make that kind of difference. Um, and actually what's running there is our Natural Academy. We're running mindfulness and nature sessions with staff. So a three-week course where staff can come in um, for three hours um, and have a proper grounding session, learning about resilience, um, how to support themselves, but using nature. So we ran sessions like making bird feeders, weaving with materials, um, a walk focusing on beauty in the nature. Um, so that was really popular and so we're going to be running those sessions again this summer as well which is really exciting um, and on the right hand side is our butterfly walk so we have these amazing meadows and attenuation ponds at Southmead Hospital as well as part of our drainage so we've been working to improve the wildflower meadows but to do that we wanted to know what species we had so working with the butterfly conservation society we've been running monthly walks um, next year that's expanding to do a whole transect of the hospital site as well but uh, patients staff um, and volunteers can come along on those walks. That's an example of them just identifying some species. And then in those wildflower meadows, we've been changing the management plan with the contractors as well. So 
This winter, we left areas for refugia, which is so the overwintering um, caterpillars and butterflies have a space to go. So hopefully next year, we'll see more species and a, a bigger biodiversity as well. So those are just kind of some examples I wanted to give you. Um, there's a lot going on. I could probably talk to you for hours about what we're doing. Um, <laughs> but yeah, just to give you some of the examples and tasters of what I do as my, as my role um, as a nature recovery ranger. Um, and I sit within the sustainability development unit, which I should have mentioned. So there's uh, four of us, and then I've got two interns as well who work three days a week with me um, to try and train them up so then they can move into the conservation sector within the NHS healthcare service as well, which is really important. Um, so that's kind of my summary there. Thank, you, thank you so much for you. And your enthusiasm for these projects really comes <laughs> through. And it's a bit, it's, honestly, I'm, at, I'm, I'm dead impressed. There's so much going on there. It's really amazing to see sort of the practical implementation of it. One, one follow-up question. You mentioned volunteering mm. and getting some of the NHS staff themselves to volunteer. Yeah. How has that gone? I mean, uh, Professor Powers talked about some of the pressures mm. on the workforce. Yeah. It, are they finding it an important e opportunity to get some escapism? How, how have you kind of got people interested in that? Yeah, that has been one of the trickiest things with working with uh, timetables, lunch breaks, only half an hour, finding time for them to come away from the wards. Um, one of the things I try to be really flexible, so we've been running specific team sessions, kind of occupational therapists are really enthusiastic because they know the benefits really well. I think getting the teams out who are less aware, so the, we struggle to engage with porters or facilities and estates, but they're not necessarily on the computer as much, so it's harder to engage with them. I think emails don't work, so we need posters to tell them what's available. Um, so I think that communication, but it's definitely improved. So at the beginning, we had, well, we had some volunteers at the allotment, but otherwise there was nothing. And now I think I had 30 members of staff coming. We did a wreath making session over Christmas. That was very, very popular. Um, so I think I had 30 staff members come to that. And just because it was something slightly different, um, they really engaged with it. And they took the time off. Someone told me they knew they were coming, so they took an extra hour for lunch, and they've worked an extra hour in the day. So if people really want to do it, they can. But I think managers, it's really key for managers to have this, to support that staff are allowed to do those things for their own well-being and, and mental health as well, because that's the, that's the focus, really, on those. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, we'll now go to Abe. So Abe Rogers was the winner of last year's Wilson Economics Prize. Can you hear us, Abe? Hey, loud and clear, Robert. Thank you uh, so much for, for having us. Um, and obviously, thanks to the Wolfens having the competition. And it's, it's already last year that we won it. It obviously feels a bit more like this year. Um, it's really interesting hearing what everyone else has been saying today, because I think it's all coming from such a similar place. The, 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 the problems are maybe somewhat um, obvious to, to an extent of how to, to create these greater living environments for recovery and for work. Um, and, for, and for health creation. I think our thesis really starts with this notion of the third carer. So if you had the doctors and we had the nurses and we had the families and the friends, the third carer is the environment that we, that, that we live in, that we re recover in. Uh, next slide, please. Um, our vision for the future, um, of, it celebrates the art of care. We, we really believe in care. And I think as we've all been saying through COVID, we've really discovered the power of care, both the body and the mind, treating the sick and the well and everyone in between. It's inspired by the adaptive qualities of the living systems. It's connected and forward-looking institution that grows and changes in response to the environment and the needs of its communities. So this is really the key to our, our concept, which is rather than creating a hospital per se, creating something we have been calling the living system, which is really based more about health creation than simply about uh, trying to cure the, 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 the sick. So within, within this living system, we're looking, uh, next slide, please. Um, so within this living system, we're looking at, at everything that we need to, to, to stay well. So social prescriptions, health creation, debt advice, housing, um, better diet, better food. And to really work out what it, what, what we needed it to get there with, we have been talking to a huge panel of, of experts from doctors, nurses, neuroscientists, neurologists, wayfinding experts, engineers, acoustician, lighting designers, 
uh, artists, to, but to say a, a few. And the, you know, we really believe that the hospital cannot be designed by the uh, by the visionary. It needs to be designed by the community for the community coming from the, the, the community. So one of the notions of the living system is it needs to embrace the local culture and it needs to be, it needs to be about localism. It needs to be aware of, of what is around it and how we can, we can bring in the surroundings into the community. Um, next slide, please. So here we look at a kind of section of this hospital as, as, we, have, as, we, have, as we have imagined it. So on a kind of the simplest basis, we start with the kind of marketplace. And the marketplace sells vegetables, it sells cooked food, but it also has social services on board, in, on, on, on board it. It has primary care there. It has alternative medicine. It has, uh, it, and it has uh, community kitchens and, and, and the things that the, the local community needs to, 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 to improve. As we go up into the, to the, uh, the next floor, we're looking at a more dynamic kind of laboratory system. Then we go on to our, our levitating park and into the, to the building itself. You know, um, each, each, each floor is, is, becomes a completely different kind of self-created community, mixing both uh, the, the, the wards as well as, the, um, as well as outpatients. So, you, so they become community, communities around the subject. And every, every ward, which contains up to six people, um, has access to a pocket garden, which we'll come more into later. And the rooftop, like described before, has an allotment with vegetation, and the vegetation is being, is being brought back into the hospital um, to form part of the, of, of, of the diet. Like in, uh, in, in, in Aldershot, we have a, a chef on every single floor who's preparing food on the floor to the local, um, to, 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 the, to the staff and for the, the patients. Uh, next slide, please. This is a kind of a, a generic uh, ward, a floor as we see it, sorry. The yellow is showing um, outpatients, the blue is showing inpatients. You know, one of the really key things we believe in the design of the hospital is about scale. We need to keep things feeling domestic and intimate. We mustn't frighten people with giant corridors with endless spaces to get lost, hiding away from daylight. So you can see these petals containing the wards. Each petal has access to a single garden. And through the system that we've developed, we can also rapidly change these into, into single, uh, to single room wards. Our worry about the single room wards, as well as being obviously easier places to keep clean, is the social aspects and the lack of community. And the recovery speed from many of the studies we've seen is faster in shared wards than single wards. But where our shared wards are different is we have everybody facing out of the window looking at their rapidly growing trees. And in the, in the outpatients, we have larger daylight, the waiting area, which is such an important area, is, is fueled by light and also has an external terrace. Uh, next slide, please. For us, the, the third care is about creating these domestic environments. So, you know, why can't we use, we, why can't we use wood as, as a warm, tactile, sustainable material to surround people in? We want to challenge the perceptions of, of, uh, of, of, of bio um, issues. And, and we believe the, the way to maintain, maintain hygiene through, through different materials, a study which we can go into much later. But it's creating these small areas where you can still be part of a community, but you can receive privacy at the, at the, at the same time. We have a kind of a, a, a living room at the end of the, of, of, of the petal. Um, next slide, please. You know, on a simplest basis, when you're lying down, you're in a completely private environment. You can't see your neighbors. But when you sit up, then you can talk across to them. So it's this, this change between private and public. You have the curtain that, that, that pulls and closes, obviously. And we have this, this is a 2.4 meter environment with soft materials all around you. So acoustically, it's soft. You look out the window, you can see the plant. You look at, you go to the window, you can open it. So it becomes this, this ecosystem um, working through, throughout. And then your local kitchen brings you the food. Uh, next slide, please. So then this starts looking at these, what we're calling these pocket gardens, these little living rooms, community spaces, where you can have consultation or family gatherings or a mixture of people from the ward can come, can come together. 
the plants growing up and then the influence of the plants on the roots and the notion of kind of biophilia, which we're all talking about today um, so, so clearly. Next slide, please. And this is just a kind of small interventions that we're kind of illustrating, which would be in the, in the outpatients area, which is a small room which um, converts between a completely acoustically sealed sleeping couchette for the doctors and nurses in their crazy hours. And we all know how many accidents happen through, through sleep deprivation. And we also know how precious space is in the hospital. And then it can convert back into a little office. So it's this idea of these dedicated spaces. We really need to look after the people running the hospital as well as the patients. So this is just a tiny nudge in how we can start to do that. Next slide, please. There should be one more slide, which is a little film. Okay. Yeah, if we had, yeah? if, if we, if we had the final slide, which is a little film, we could see the rapid transformation. Our whole system is designed around a, a prefabricated modular system, and it illustrates how we can transform from um, having a. Uh, two bays of, of, of three beds, a six bed petal can transform into, into, into uh, five different uh, uh, private rooms. And that and by using prefabrication um, and dry systems, we can easily transform into different environments. Whereas the traditional system of the hospital now, which is about plasterboard, wet, docile materials that have to be ripped out, thrown away, consuming carbon all, all, all the time. Um, so I think that's a, you know, it's a, a very speedy run through of what was six months of, of, of work and, and thinking and conversations. Um, but we passionately believe in, 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 in the change that we, can, that we can create. We passionately believe in creating holistic solutions that look after um, the community that, that are about health creation. And we passionately believe in, 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 in protecting and nurturing the doctors, the nurses, the staff and the patients. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abe. Um, and sorry again about that last slide. Um, we have already got some questions coming in, but just a reminder for the online audience as well that you can raise your hand in Zoom and we'll try and bring you in. Um, I'll hand over to Laura and then we'll go to the Q&A. Um, thanks, Robert. Um, I think, as you mentioned, I had the privilege of being a, one of the judges of the Wilson Prize last year. And I think you're absolutely right. There, there wasn't one submission that didn't consider um, not just the kind of physical built environment um, of the hospital, but the, the, the views and access to nature, um, the role that light um, and, and atmosphere um, sort of caused. So it was a, it was a real honour to kind of see that mission, if you like, being pushed forward. And of course, to have Abe as, as the winner um, was um, a, a fantastic exemplar of that. Um, in, in my sort of day-to-day -day work at, um, at Maggie Centres, um, we've started from the kind of very beginning with um, the, 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 the function of our, our building and our environment about being an enabler to, I think actually, as, as they put it, to, to being part of the caring system within which the work that our um, cancer health professionals that we employ and who work in the centres and those with cancer and their family and, and friends who come to our, our centres experience. Um, and with accessing a, a, a building um, that, and a garden and a landscape and views and, and with um, natural light, um, what visitors are exposed to is an opportunity where nature is distracting, thought-provoking. Um, as they come in, the, their anxiety is already starting to evaporate. So you can see if you can get the, in our experience at Maggie's, if you can get the combination of those things, they um, become assets that help you as, as, as health professionals um, do your work. Um, we've come to understand as we've grown, we've now have 24 centres, that the, the evolution of the garden shouldn't come secondary to the building. It should be designed and built um, from the outset, and, and with that, you get something sort of more magical. Um, clearly, we're on hospital grounds. Um, they're not the easiest places, as I think Phoebe would um, articulate, is to, to, but there are always wonderful um, pockets of, of nature, and you can do something kind of very magical that can, can help our, our work. 
and uh, one of the gardens in our centre that is at the Royal Marsden was designed by a landscaper called Pete Oldoff. And one of Pete's specialties is about the role of planting through that winter season when it starts to decay and die. And, and that in itself becomes a very, um, in our world of working with people with cancer, a, a very helpful therapeutic um, a, a tool within which to have conversations of those people who are facing um, uh, um, uh, that end of life um, sort of journey. Um, I, I've also been impressed by other um, uh, people who have kind of led the way in this. Um, uh, another charity called Horatio's Gardens has um, developed gardens alongside uh, new, uh, neurosurgical units and they themselves have evidenced the role of being able as part of the post-recovery um, for patients to be able to um, access out into gardens through um, beds with um, very technical equipment and, and the benefit that the, that the health professionals talk about um, that for themselves. And then through COVID, um, our centres were also places of respite for um, NHS staff. And again, when they came into the centre, not only were we able to offer them perhaps a cup of tea and um, 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 some cake, um, NHS staff do like their cakes, um, but actually one of the things they talked about was that being able to be um, in nature, to see nature, um, to actually to be rest the restorativeness that comes with that. And it's a it's a primal response. I think when we get it right, people don't just feel better, people are better. Um, so I'm very passionate about the, the work that, that Phoebe is doing that can kind of come through our existing hospital estate and I think the opportunities that we have with our, our new hospital estate that's, that's coming. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. And um, just one, one follow up. You mentioned that point around um, sort of NHS staff using Maggie's mm. centres and obviously there is an adjacency there at the moment where they are often on the, on the edge of the boundary of a hospital. Um, are, how much of Maggie's ethos can be mimicked in actual medical buildings delivering care? Are there genuine transferable lessons or do you need to embrace the difference? I, I think there are lessons. It's about the, um, they're obviously not um, in terms of kind of building size type and what some of the NHS capital has to do in terms of very technical um, complex spaces. Um, but I think um, there are lessons around how um, if you use design and access to nature, how that can enhance the, not just the patient experience, but the staff who come and work in Maggie's have come from the NHS. So we employ your brilliant um, expert cancer support specialist and clinical psychologist. And what they all talk about is that being able to work in, a, in an environment that has um, those, those natural elements that they can actually be better at doing their job, they feel more supported. Um, so I think, I think there are lessons that we can offer, um, albeit it's, it's a different sort of scale and, and uh, um, challenge. Great. Um, we're, I'm going to throw out questions in a moment, but I will take Chair's prerogative just for one, mm -hmm. just to come back to you, Professor Powis. Um, we've heard some really good examples of where things are going well, and North Bristol is a sort of shining example of innovation. Um, I, I suspect there are probably trusts which, where this is not a priority um, for many understandable reasons, but how, what's the role of the centre and, and then it, the NHS to sort of encourage this to be spread more consistently, do you think? Well, I, I, I've got some of the examples and some of the national schemes that we've got, Phoebe, Phoebe's an example of that, uh, uh, to encourage um, better design, more thoughtful design, uh, and also uh, obviously the green agenda, the net emissions uh, ambition. Uh, so I think the opportunities are there for all organisations, whether it's hospital trust, whether it's a GP surgery. Uh, you're right, there's a, always a set of competing priorities. Uh, part of our job at the centre is to set the framework, to give the support and the opportunities. Um, but also to recognise we have a very mixed estate. Uh, so I think part of the challenge is, is very contingent upon the estate that, that you have. Uh, obviously we are you know, building new hospitals, but a lot of this is around what you do with existing hospitals. Uh, and I think there are lots of opportunities. Uh, and, and some of those are quite simple. Uh, so we, we were just talking, I used to be at the Royal Free and we were just talking, there's a, there's a little space outside the Royal Free, the Royal Free sits on Pond Street, which is a busy road in North London, it's a, it's, it's a sort of um, entrance to the hospital, it's quite close to the ward, but there's a, there's a sliver of land uh, that a couple of years ago the volunteers mm. at the hospital just you know, replanted, 
Uh, and, and it makes such a huge difference just because it's the first thing that you see as you come up Bourne Street into that hospital. Oh. And it's just simple things like that that don't cost a ton of money. They do require some volunteering time in that case and some maintenance that really makes a difference. So, so I think wherever you look, um, there are opportunities. Uh, our job is to help people um, uh, take those opportunities and, and to improve the environment. Uh, and I think the other thing is around good design because I think the golden thread through some of what, what's been said, and Abe, I think, has, has, has really uh, you know, exemplified this is, uh, and, and that's, that's the common thread, I think, between the Maggie centres and, and, and hospital estate is, is good, thoughtful design uh, is really critical. There's a, there's a big difference between just having a single room and having a, a thoughtful design of a single room that takes into account that you lose some of the community that you get on a ward when you are in a room. Uh, and so I think it's for everybody within the NHS just to think about that design and to think about there is a person or there are people who are using this and, and how, if it was me, uh, either as a visitor, as a patient or as a, another member of staff, what would I really like? What would make me happier? What would me, make me feel more reassured? Uh, what would make me feel more welcomed? And no, I, I would support, I mean, certainly our experience of working very closely with your NHS kind of leadership and effectiveness, for example, Linda Pollard, um, when we were working on the lead centre, and um, we had the only patch of green grass that was left on the St James's site. And she was, you can have it, but you have to create a garden and an environment that not just Maggie's beneficiaries can enjoy, um, but those arriving at the hospital, the centre visitors and the staff. So I actually think that the ambition is, is absolutely there and they're taking every opportunity they can to, uh, um, to work with that. Um, I'll, I know we've got a couple of questions online, but first we'll go to the room. So I don't know if there's anyone in the room that would like to ask a question. Gentlemen, just from there. If you, if you could uh, take the microphone just so the audience yeah, online can hear it. Thank you very much. Can you just say that with regard to how the NHS is evolving with social care, and obviously in the last two to three years, mental health has become much more discussed and important. Does all of what you're doing, excellent what you're doing, sort of have added value and importance going forward? Because it's not just the person who's medically ill, but it's making sure that during their time in hospital and afterwards, that they are strengthened mentally as well as physically. Could you just um, say where you're from? Your so, so, uh, Child Surveyor. So I work with a lot of the large um, investors, sovereign wealth funds and investors. Mainly, of course, that's into the private sector across all, all types of real estate. But at the same time, what I'm finding is there's a lot of interest from the larger private sector to help more what you all are all doing alongside. So that's nothing to do with the medical side of NHS and privatisation. It's not at all. It's more the type of landlord and developers I work with are very interested in what you're all doing. That's really encouraging. Um, Abe, could I maybe come to you first for some initial thoughts and we'll go along the line? Well, I think I just wanted to go back briefly to the conversation before um, that I was trying to come, to, 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 to come in on. I think for me, the, the a real problem is the priority of the hospital too often becomes the car and the car park and the spaces that we could be using for, for, for greenery is occupied by firstly cars and secondly by plant. Why are all the roofs of hospitals used to house the plant rather than having a more considered solution where we can use it to have allotments, to grow gardens, to give people, to, to, to allow things to, to be alive, um, I think is, 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 is of the, the, the former most uh, in, in, in important to us. It's about trying to, to create this list of, of, of priorities um, to, to, in, in how we can really forge ahead the, the change. Thanks, Abe. Um, Phoebe, how, how can we get us, I guess, a sort of more excitement and more interest in this agenda then from perhaps people outside of the healthcare space too? Um, <clears throat> I think we do, we have a lot of donations, but it's, yeah, it depends on, on what they want to donate to. So the allotment at the Southend Hospital is a lot of local Bristol-based big organisations, not massive ones, but they definitely have an interest. Um, I think it's reaching out to people. I think if you just ask, I think people don't know you're doing it until you tell them and explain what it is and have a conversation with them. But I think the charity team at Southend Hospital are really lucky, is really, really great. So they, 
they give us those opportunities, but it could be, yeah, widely spoken about, I guess, yeah, coming more kind of talks like this, more conversations with people, more advertising it and kind of asking for the, asking for the help, I guess, if you, if you want to have that support from external funders and things like that. Yeah, I ask for a lot of stuff, actually, in my role, because I'm, I don't have all the funding. And so, um, yeah, just having conversations with people and explaining what you're doing. We've had donations from local nurseries for plants worth, I think, around like £300, which isn't loads of money, but it does make that difference where then you can improve that space. But yeah, I think there's loads of things. Yeah, I think as Professor Farrell said, these are quite low-cost interventions sometimes, mm, so it's yeah. going to unlock a, a big benefit. Um, Laura, yeah, I mean, I think on that kind of wider social care issue, if we're talking to people about um, uh, their, their physical fitness, their diet, um, mm. and their mental health, uh, actually about practicing that, evidencing that, rather than just um, lecturing. So having, um, in our case, our Manchester Centre has got an allotment, um, the veg comes in, people can take it away, but it's also making fresh soups and serving it. So you're talking about nutrition, you're asking people to help work in the garden and enjoying the gardener. Mm. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's turning it from a kind of um, a, a being told what to do, but actually engaging with people in a way that they can, they can, they can participate and then benefit. Well, I think, I think um, you know, healthcare settings are community spaces too. I think that's the mm. first point. Uh, obviously, not all of hospitals are, are you know, community spaces, but particularly the entrances, the ground floors, the, the accessible places are community spaces, and there's a lot of footfall through them. Uh, and that's visitors, it's people in the local community, of course it's staff. So I think really good, you know, thoughtful design and use of those spaces, uh, welcoming people in, allowing communities to use those spaces uh, if, if they need to and if they want to, uh, I think really goes a, a long way towards providing that sort of mental and the physical well-being you're talking about. And of course, we're really conscious that coming out of the pandemic, we have a b got a big responsibility to our staff in terms of their well-being. They've, they've been through an awful lot and they're exhausted. Uh, and whenever I talk to staff, whenever I go around, I'm really conscious that, that you know, people want to, you know, have that uh, time and space and, and that recovery. Uh, and I think the environment in which they work is a really key component of that. Uh, so, um, you know, Abe mentioned office spaces. Uh, it's not just the patient, patient facing spaces, it's the, it's the entirety uh, of, of these buildings that I think, you know, have so much, not just for patients, to offer to patients, but for the local community too. We'll go out for further questions. Would anyone in the physical audience, Jane? Hi there. Um, James Ilman from Health Service Journal. Um, I just wanted to unpack a little bit the single rooms issue and sort of the retention of the social and community benefits uh, of wards, um, but at the same time having single rooms. And I guess a question for um, all, all of you really, how, how does that kind of work in, in practice? Um, and a question for Professor Powers, are you, are you gonna introduce standards um, for, we obviously have a massive new hospitals programs ongoing. Uh, are, are, are there going to be standards to ensure this happens? How, how are you going to ensure that this, this agenda um, gets real traction? Because obviously there'll be huge funding implications. Fantastic. Um, Abe, if we perhaps go to you first, just I know you did a lot of thinking about this in your Walton submission, and then we'll go to Professor Patterson down the road. Well, um, I think it falls in, 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 in three, I think, as Professor Paris said before, it's not about having a private room or, or a, a single occupancy room, it's about having the right single occupancy room with the right elements in it. In our findings, most of the, the reports we found pointed to the fact that the, the community of a shared ward, when, when the right ward is run in the right way, was more, was far, we had faster uh, recovery and less deaths than, than single words. From the simple thing of someone saying, hey, he's, the guy next door sounds like he's breathing really badly. Um, these, these, these whole. Now, that's not to say there's not ways of creating um, hybrids in between where we have private rooms, but we give ample space for, for, to, to, for, for community and we're really encouraging people to come together. But the, the biggest problem that occurs to us in our, in, in, our, in our research in this area is the hospital clock. 
So if we spend our days in hospital, in bed, in pajamas, impotent, without any power, we will, we, we, will, we will take much longer to recover than if we feel the progression of the day, if we are aware of shadow passing and going. If there are a series, if, there is, if there's birds singing in the morning and there's quiet in the afternoon. So this, uh, we are, we're, we're alive, we're watching, the, we're, part of, we're taking part in the day, we're not passively standing, standing by. And that's very true if it is a private, if it is a single occupancy room or, or, or a shared room. So how can we disturb and nudge the patient to, be, to, be, to take part in, in, in the everyday, even if they're bedridden? For me, that becomes the key question to all of this. And then how can we get people out of their bedrooms and into, into community space, again, and into the garden, when that is bedridden or, or not? But we've got to, we've got to occupy people's day with... with uh, with, with fulfilled feeling, feelings. So on the single rooms question, um, I think there are two things that are that w when you talk to patients, you talk to staff about this that, that come up, and we've heard of, of one of them, which is uh, the loss of the sense of community that you get a bit from when you're in a in a, a ward that's got uh, more beds, a bit more of an open space. Uh, the second thing is is the workforce model that um, needs to be changed a bit when you're dealing with uh, single ward, single rooms rather than than the. the um, you know, four bedded areas or, or op more open spaces. Uh, I think the, uh, and, and of course they are, you know, the, they are genuine things to think about. Uh, and I think Abe's, you know, hit the nail on the head uh, that the important thing is to recognize that they are issues that need to be thought through. Uh, and therefore you need to design into uh, the spaces uh, around the wards, uh, within the wards, the opportunity for that community to be maintained. Uh, so, you know, unless there's a clear medical reason for, for isolation, ensure that people have spaces where they can um, get that sense of community. So it's a combination of the privacy and the dignity of the single room, of the single bathroom, for instance, but also the opportunity uh, to have that community uh, interaction when you need it. And I think you can do both. It's not one or the other. It's not either or. It's both and. It, it requires good design. It requires thoughtfulness. It requires the operational... Uh, uh, aspects to it too, and I think also on the on the um, workforce models, there are you know you, there there are advantages, and digital technology can can aid in this. Uh, the last hospital I was involved with was, was a new build at Chase Farm, single rooms, uh, lots of opportunities to use technology actually to make the the, the, the nursing workforce work more efficiently. You, you can use digital call bells. You don't need to. Uh, call somebody over to tell them what you want. You can just do that through using a, a, a digital process. So I think there's lots of opportunities, but it has to be designed in from the start. It has to be thought through. Uh, a question of standards, clearly um, the uh, hospital build team at uh, DH thinking through all these things, uh, looking at, at, at what we should be doing going forward, including the economic benefits. Uh, so I would leave that to them. Uh, but, uh, and, and I think the final thing to say is it's not, you know, the, the, I don't think it would be a circumstance where you would say absolutely all single rooms. It's still a mix. But I think you, the approach is to say, OK, well, let's start from a position where, where you know, single rooms is maybe, you know, what we want more single rooms. How would you design those in so that we, um, that we don't lose the, the benefits of, uh, of the sort of uh, settings that we've got at the moment? And I think the final thing that Abe has touched on is flexibility. Uh, and, and I think that is something that is really important, that to have um, structures that are more flexible in their usage going forward. Uh, and I think that's a real opportunity uh, to, to think about how uh, we build buildings that can evolve during their lifespan, rather than simply be set for the next 20 or 30 years in a particular configuration. Mm. I think it's uh, the example at the Brunel building where the, the ICU, they're all kind of single occupancy mm. rooms, but they do open up, they've kind of got two pods, but they and they have windows, but they're not really looking, the beds aren't aimed that direction. So I think the roof terrace is a really, really great, amazing thing, but it's taken so long to get going. But it's interesting that it just wasn't incorporated into the original design. It could have been, just wasn't, so money maybe. But then they haven't had any space, even the like visiting visiting um, relatives haven't had a, a nice space to go to, like a, the waiting room is kind of inside, there isn't any greenery in there, so that, bringing that in, but it is, a, it is achievable, that's the thing, you can change the space, we've managed to change the space, and now 
um, hopefully soon the patients then will be allowed to go outside. I think we can have two patients out there with um, nurses and some, some visitors as well. So they'll have that community aspect and element then, whereas now they don't really have anything at all. So it is, I think it really is important. And I think at Bristol as well, we kind of have, there are single occupancy rooms at Bristol, but then there's also four bedrooms. And I, I know some patients start off in single occupancy and then, and then move up kind of to the more social when they're <laughs> get um, promoted up but um, and that seems to work relatively well I think in that community you're kind of better you've had your privacy and then you kind of you do need that social element then as well I think it's important mm. fantastic and um, we've got a few questions online unless there's any in the audience here um, so we'll, we'll try and bring the relevant people in so first we're going to go to Anne Farthing then we've got John Hislop and finally Paul Hamblin so and if you can hear us, and um, if you could unmute and ask your question to the panel. Hi there. Um, many thanks for the fascinating talk. Um, Abe, your account of a hospital day made me um, quite tearful. You clearly understand what it's like to be a patient. So thank you for that. That's the first time I've seen your presentation. I've asked loads of things in the chat box, but basically it's around infection control and mandating we wanted to irrigate balconies, but they would not pass that. That was in 2016. And someone else has asked about infection control. Um, they are, they do have to sign off our, during design development. So I'd like some reflection on infection control input. And could you just panel. say which organization you're from, please? Guys of the St. Thomas's NHS Trust. Great, thank you. Um, so on the topic of infection prevention and control, um, Professor Powers, I might come to you. That's okay. Well, so infection prevention control, as, as everybody who <laughs> works in the health service or access health service, is really critical. It always has been. Uh, of course, it's been you know really in focus, obviously because of the pandemic. But every winter we see norovirus, uh, and we have to um, you know we configure um, um, wards and where patients are to deal with with you know that, that winter viruses. So so it's not new, uh, but. But yes, there has been uh, clearly a lot of focus on it because of the, um, the pandemic. Um, so I think coming out of the pandemic, uh, we, you know, we obviously you know, need to think what we've learned uh, through the pandemic. We um, need to uh, think about uh, everything from, uh, from cleaning regimes, which we've thought hard about during this, through to ventilation is another issue I know that, that the pandemic uh, particularly shone a light on in terms of um, respiratory infections. Uh, so uh, obviously IPC is, is, is more than just the design of the estate, but the design and the configuration of the estate you know, plays a large part in, in how we can approach uh, IPC. And, and if you have an estate, for instance, uh, an emergency department, where the cubicles are very close together or lots of open spaces, I know it is very challenging for our staff working in those areas to separate out uh, patients who they are concerned might have a, an infection that they, they worry might uh, uh, transmit to others. So, so it is clearly important that the configuration of the estate and the design of the estate uh, has infection prevention and control processes and requirements in, in mind. And I think that will be one of the things that clearly, uh, you know, having focused on this a lot over the last two years with the pandemic, we, we will be uh, evolving and thinking hard about coming out of it. Fantastic. Um, well, uh, Laura, I'm just wondering, that? Abe, you might have something to add uh, on you're, that. Actually, Abe, you talked about using different textures in a hospital, incorporating wood, for example. How can we do that in a way that preserves world-leading IPC standards? Oh, we, I mean, we work in, a, in, a, in quite a, we're working in the guys in St. Thomas's, we're also working in, 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 in St. Mary's and, and, and in Char and Charing Cross. And this is, these are conversations we come across all the time. We see existing situations in, in Charing Cross, particularly there's an unpainted MDF box, which has been sitting there for as long as I've been visiting it, which is absorbing everything that is passing it. But yet if we propose to use a timber handrail, they will talk about infection control. So for me, there's, there is a need of updating the science of what confection control is and how it operates. There is a love of plastics, which are soft materials that scratch very easily. And as soon as they're scratched, they have crevices within them, which can really store in infection. There is a hatred of wood, which is self-repairing, which, uh, which has natural oils that, that, that are um, antibacterial. 
I don't know, on, on a kind of very simplistic example, we know from COVID um, that COVID lasts half a day on a piece of paper and four days on stainless steel, which is totally contrary to the way that we are, the, the, the way that the hospital will, will, will rule its, its materials. So I really think there is, there is, I, there is need to, to, to make our notions of material-based infections control more scientific and more contemporary and less, less around assumptions. By the way, I'm not saying that we should have plants inside hospitals. I realize that's very problematic, but I am saying we need to, to, to refresh our, our, our thoughts. I think with the, the irrig I think she mentioned irrigation. Mm. Um, so we have come across that problem. So uh, lots of our areas, so the root terrace has no irrigation, which does cause issues with watering and maintenance and then the, the plants die. Um, so <laughs> there is that issue, but then you need the volunteers, that's where the volunteers come into it. You need to have people who are dedicated or an estates team who are dedicated to looking after the spaces, have access to roof spaces. So not everyone is allowed in certain areas to so have roof terraces. Um, but we have a lot of green roofs, which is an alternative. So we've been looking at planting, like drought tolerant planting, plants that don't need watering or only need watering slightly. Um, green roofs don't need watering at all. So they're kind of like seed and self propagating. Um, so in terms of wanting to improve your terraces, I think it's, good, it's, a it's a conversation you need to have about different alternatives that you can do. So we are using wood in the roof terrace, but the seats are recycled plastic because they need them to be wipeable surfaces um, to sanitize them essentially. But they're okay with the planters being wooden. So it's finding that, that balance and that having long, longer conversations with infection control and explaining why you want to do what you're what you're doing and finding a solution rather than just a saying no, I think is a bit disheartening. But I think there needs to be some some give and take with infection control sometimes. And then see what we do. Yeah, those are some really practical words of advice. <laughs> um, next, we'll go to John Hislop. John, can you um, ask a question, please? Thank you. Uh, as a fellow competitor, may I offer my congratulations to the winners? Um, I was a little disappointed you didn't like my idea of an autonomous bed, but there you are. Um, the green agenda is absolutely fine and perfect, but I think to move the NHS forward, we've got to have systems of work which change. And I, I'm encouraged to see the integration of the uh, public market and public space into the hospital and, and in fact, perching, perching the hospital above it which was similar to my model, but if the community is going to integrate with the hospital or the hospital integrate with the community, can I ask how you see that community uh, getting a voice? Because at the moment, elected councillors, uh, for example, have no role in the NHS. When I first started, there was a DHA, which was executive locally and which involved councillors, they had a statutory role to lead the NHS locally. Do you see that coming back, or do you think the community voice is just going to be based around willing volunteers? Thank you. Thank, thank you, John. Um, and may I ask, what, what's your organisation? Uh, yeah, I am an individual. I worked in the NHS for 42 years. I'm retired now, but I'm still doing teleradiology for the NHS out of hours, which is a fantastically enjoyable professional contribution still. Um, my story was um, one of the entries. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, John. Yeah, great to hear some questions for some entrants. Um, perhaps, Laura, on getting the community involved, is it currently working well, or do we need to think about different ways of engaging? Um, well, I mean, in kind of a sort of in a Maggie's way, um, uh, when we employ our architect and our design team, um, we are employing them as the investigator of the social problem. And in our case, the social problem is how do you create an environment and a space and a place that can um, enhance uh, uh, cancer um, um, communication and interaction um, to deal with issues of survivorship and. Um, and living with um, cancer. And so in our case, that if, if, you, if you've got an investigator who is skilled in expertise, they have to go out and speak to a whole range of, of, of different people and disciplines. So I think input is, of course, 
um, is essential. I think there's always a dilemma of designing by committee, um, which can mean that you can get the um, lowest opportunity output as opposed to the, um, to the maximum um, um, uh, opportunity. So I think it's about the, the, the design team and thinking about, again, you know, in your world, um, Stephen, you know, in the heart of the NHS. Um, but of course they go out, and I know they do, um, go out and get that, that expertise input. And Professor Powers, I know there's a big shift towards integrated working yes. with local authorities. Is that a place for that in the estate too? Yeah, so, so should uh, healthcare organisations and their uh, estates um, work closely with local communities? Absolutely yes, and I think you know, good organisations, and that's not just hospitals, it's, it's primary care, it's general practice, it's pharmacy, do work closely with, mm. with communities uh, for all the reasons that we've said, and also because they are often large local employers as well. Uh, so many of the local community work in these, in these settings. So I think getting that relationship right and having a, a beneficial relationship with, with local communities uh, is really important. Uh, and, and, and of course, part of that is working with local government. Uh, it's not all of it, but it's certainly a very important part of it. And as you said, Robert, the move to integrated care systems, to integrated care boards, is an important uh, step in the process. Uh, of integrating uh, the various partners who work in health and social care, and I would include local government in that, and local communities. That is exactly what integrated care systems and integrated care boards uh, are, are, are designed to do. Uh, clearly they are being established uh, in law as we speak because mm -hmm. the bill is going through, through Parliament here in England, uh, and clearly, although they have been working in, in various forms, if you want shadow <coughs> form over the last few years, uh, they are allowed to, you know, to take on those um, those local responsibilities. So, yes, I think the, si the, the 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 most successful ones and the ones that are working the best are the ones that are really conscious of 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 making those relationships uh, work. They are really critical because uh, healthcare is not, and the NHS is not an island. <laughs> uh, it needs to work closely with social care domiciliary care, it needs to work closely with local government, and actually in the pandemic we have seen that happening. Uh, I think if you talk to uh, local NHS systems, they have been working really closely with local government, local public health, and that needs to continue. Something else coming out of the pandemic uh, that we need to do more of, not less of. Um, well, I do a lot of community focus work as part of the, the project I'm on and so we work a lot with the Bristol City Council actually so we ran they have a lot of volunteers within their parks in Bristol who are kind of different sectors so we ran a course on green and social prescribing at the hospital and we invited the volunteers to come I think a group of 10 of them um, from all over Bristol um, but that was yeah led by the Bristol City Council so we do we work quite closely with them especially on different things like uh, the pesticide reduction so Bristol wants to go pesticide free so working with them to see what their policies are uh, Bristol's ecological emergency so we link in with those goals at the hospital as well so we have quite a good communication with them about the work we're doing and what they're doing in that sense which I think does work well but then that depends on every hospital every where they're based and what they're, how their other councils are run. Um, but just from my experience, that has worked quite well. And I think it's it continuing to work more. I think we're engaging with each other more and more, especially when it comes to the green space use and that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. Hey, anything to add? Um, in our utopic hospital of the future, um, I mean, it's not a million miles from what Professor Paris is, is to say, but it's really about creating an, an interact, sorry, an, in, an engaged, um, panel of uh, governance, which includes the patients, the doctors, the, 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 the social workers, the local councillors, as well as the NHS. For us, the, the, the hospital has to be integrated right into the community. We want tentacles that run out of the hospital to the community, and these tentacles also bring the community back into the hospital. So it becomes a tool for urban regeneration, rather than in the worst case situations that we see now, I could mention a few, the hospital turns its back on the community and becomes an island, which is exactly what you're saying that we, we, we don't want. So it, it, it's imperative that we are, we are working together, that these are, these, these are joint conversations, uh, and that we, that we remove all islands, and why don't we rejoin Europe at the same time? <laughs> Thanks for the party political <laughs> broadcast, Abe. Hey, um, I'm going to take two final questions at the same time because we're creeping up towards two o'clock. So um, we're going to go to Paul Hamblin first and then Benji Horwell. So, Paul. 
Hello, um, <clears throat> thank you, and, and great uh, series of presentations. Uh, my name is Paul Hamblin, and I work at National Parks England. Um, <clears throat> the National Parks were set up a year after the NHS, um, and in large part because people obviously recognise the importance of access to open spaces for the health and well-being. So it's great that we're sort of returning to some of that uh, thinking, albeit now with much better clinical underpinning. Um, the National Parks collectively have, have agreed a, a health and well-being action plan, and that includes all sorts of things for creating opportunities for both recovery and restoration, both of patients, um, but also <coughs> of staff. Um, but if I maybe um, get a bit more personal for a moment, I've actually been um, receiving treatment all last year myself uh, for cancer at the Royal Free and Chase Farm, as it happens. Um, and I always look for a window in uh, whichever setting I go to. And what struck me was the potential there is to use images from our inspiring landscapes in clinical settings. And so I wondered, is this something that the NHS would like to explore with us to, to complement the improved outdoor environments and all the work that's going on there, which is absolutely vital. So in a way, enabling those inspiring in images to sort of move from coffee table books to NHS walls for therapeutic gain. Thank you, Paul. We're just going to take the second question as well, which is from Benji. Hi. Yeah, um, I'll, I'm aware of time, so I'll just I'll keep this one relatively quick. Um, I'm calling from the, the Behavioural Insights team, so in our, I work in our health and wellbeing team within it, and I guess just generally have a good interest in the built environment and how it impacts on wellbeing. Um, and I, I've really loved some of the ideas that have been talked about today, and I guess I'm conscious that there are a lot of ideas in this space, you know, whether that's the community gardens, whether that's butterfly walks and, um, you know, even redesigning hostels and the use of single rooms. And I'd just be interested to get um, the panel's thoughts on how they best see evaluation working in the space and how we can kind of, I guess, build a slightly more robust evidence base about what works and what, what helps patients' well-being and staff well-being um, based on the, the interaction with the environment in the hospital. Great. Thank you very much for your question. And so I'll, I'll take um, it in reverse order from um, the order that we went in before. And if you can also sort of say any final closing remarks at the same time. So, Laura. Um, thank you. I think first to Paul, I think absolutely um, um, art in you know whatever form is, and I know hospitals are, have got terrific and amazing art collections, um, but absolutely bringing in some, some um, nature views um, um, to inspire. And, and I know someone who had cancer and what she had was a, a nature drawing and she put it up in her, her war, wall and she, she penciled and coloured it in. And to see the kind of tree and the pond and the and the and the views emerge for her kind of um, helped her through her um, her bone marrow transplant that she, she when she um, happened to be in hospital. So I, th I think absolutely it's got a place to play. Um, with regards to the sort of kind of evidence base, I, I think again it's sort of it's awkward and clumpy. And um, you know we've had a whole bunch of folks with PhD theses who've done stuff on on uh, on, on, on on the kind of Maggie's environment. Um, and so I think we need a a, a better way of kind of collating um, the, the best evidence so that we can we can move forward in a kind of more collective way on, on the impact of the environment um, on our health and well-being. Thank you. Hey. Um, I think first, of course, anything we can do to bring into the environment, to, to, to bring it alive um, through art, through images of, of the outdoors, I think is, 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 is a great idea. Encouragement of biophilia. The best in the end is a plant outside the window and the ability to be able to open the window. Um, when that's not possible, absolutely, I agree. I think as far as evidence, on the back of winning um, the Wolfson Prize, we had set aside 50% of the, of, of the funds to, to set, to, as a kind of seed money, to set up a design research unit. And we're very much looking into how we can really evaluate what is best practice and how we can look both from the kind of, you know, I'm convinced that the way to change uh, the, the state of hospital is for an holistic take. It's not enough to fix the, the, the single room, but every component has something to contribute. So how can we really start to evaluate 
using this, the same scientific rigor that we use in the, in the pharmaceutical industry, in the design industry. We would never put a drug on the market without testing it first, yet we are forced all the time to release design spaces to patients with, with, without testing them first. So first question, so we have um, a centre that's having some restructuring done, the windows aren't going to be there anymore. So we have an amazing fresh arts team at North Bristol Trust as well. And I know other trusts also have art departments that do put art on the walls, they work with patients and uh, staffing teams. But this project is a local artist, instead of the windows, he's creating forest scenes of what they could see through the windows. So he's kind of bringing the nature inside, which I think is really, really important and has been proven to be really important. And the evidence base, so for my role currently, we have to report um, all the time to DEFRA and the National Heritage Lottery Fund. And um, what we really focus on is who attends the events, numbers, uh, what department are they from, is always something, photographs, we take so many photographs, which they love to report, um, but also we, we're doing surveys, so questions kind of before and after, they can be really open, like how are you feeling today, anonymous, and then how did you feel afterwards, but also surveys to do a bit like a survey monkey, I guess, and then that's all going to um, a database to be processed, so I think people are doing surveys, but I think there needs to be a collaboration where all of that information comes together to build an amazing report that shows shows the evidence clearly because everyone is recording it but in slightly different different ways I think yeah and it'd be great to see some of those photos today to bring yeah. it to life I think because it's um it's often difficult just to imagine it mm. um professor Powers. yeah so we didn't really touch on on art but I couldn't agree more art is a really uh, fundamental part of, of of the design of, of these environments uh, the Royal Free actually does uh, have a very good art collection for a whole host of reasons. Um, and when you walk into the ground floor, the main uh, hospital in, in Hampstead, uh, there's a lot of thought that goes into the various paintings and art that is, is displayed there. Uh, and having more landscape art around uh, some of the national parks, I'm sure, is something uh, that the Royal Free and other hospitals would be very keen to, to con mm -hmm. consider. Uh, on the subject of parks, I am, I am very conscious that I am somebody who once ran around Hampstead Heath dressed as a vegetable. Uh, so, uh, which, which vegetable? I, I think I was a carrot, but I'm not absolutely <laughs> sure. I need to go back and look at the photographs. But anyhow, but so, uh, so parks are important. I know we talked about national parks, but all park mm. space is really, really important. Uh, so, and, and actually, the, the, it, it's gone reverse, actually. The, the collection at the Royal Free is, has, has been made into a coffee table book along with some of the other public art collections in various public uh, buildings in Camden. I think it's public art in Camden. So I don't know whether it's still available, but it was certainly uh, made into a coffee table book. So you can, you can see that art collection uh, at the leisure of your home as well if you get the book. Uh, but, um, and, and then finally, well, what would you expect to say with my academic uh, background other than yes, we should be <laughs> always uh, um, constructing an evidence base on whatever we do. Uh, actually, we talked about infection prevention and control. We need more evidence base there. Uh, good design, what works? We we need more evidence base there. You're absolutely right. We, you know, we do that uh, in in the science of healthcare. We do that in the pharmaceuticals of healthcare. We should absolutely be doing it. Although there are different ways, absolutely that you do it. But the principle of evidence generation and then following the evidence, uh, what works, is really critical. Thank you very much. That's a nice point to finish on. Well, Policy Exchange is going to still be doing more work in this area, even though the competitive element of the prize is finished. It's a real um, area of focus for us, so hopefully there'll be more events where you can join in the future. Um, I'd like to just pass on my thanks, though, to our fantastic panel today. Mm -hmm.